Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful to come into your house. God, what a joy it is to be in your presence. Tonight, as we open your word, God, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Tonight, Lord, we didn't come to hear from a man or woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. Came to hear from you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Many of them having midweek services tonight. God, we bless them as you would bless us. Bless all of our Baptists, brothers and sisters, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel, Oak Valley. And uh, we pray for the way, God, for Ecclesia, for Trinity, for Emmanuel Baptist, God. Too many to name by name. But God, if they're preaching your gospel truth, declaring your word, we bless them. Bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, the four square denomination. God, we bless our brothers and sisters tonight. Jesus' name. And Lord, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We ask that you protect them, that you bless them, God, that they endure to the end, that you deliver them, God, mightily. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. We've been in a series on Wednesday nights about grace. This is part number five, and tonight we're going to be wrapping up the series. So far, we've learned what grace is, that it is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Let's say that together tonight. If you remember it, we'll, we'll uh, say it all together, okay? Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Let's do it one more time because we've got to make sure that we understand what grace is to know where we're going tonight. Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. We started talking about the expressions of grace, how there is a grace for salvation, that it's a free gift, it's not earned. And yet we can frustrate the grace of God, or we can receive the grace of God in vain. Talked about grace for service, grace for, uh, you know, uh, every area of life. And tonight I want to talk to you about a specific grace that I see in the Word of God, and that is grace for stewardship. Grace for stewardship. Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 4. We've already used this verse in this series, but I want to point out some things from this verse as we take a look at it. 1 Peter, chapter 4. And verse number 10, it says this, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now remember, when we use this verse, we focus primarily on the word manifold, many-sided or multifaceted, that it's like a diamond. That as you turn that diamond, you can see the different colors and the different hues that are projected from the light through the same diamond, different things can come out of it. That's why we have the diamond as a part of our graphics up on the overheads behind me. But additionally, we talked about grace when we see the multifaceted grace of God that it can express itself in grace for salvation or grace for strength or grace for stewardship. Remember, we talked about grace for sanctification, that we are to be holy and separated unto the Lord. And so as we take a look at this grace, we realize that grace really can go in many different directions. And tonight as we look at grace for stewardship, we see this. It says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, that we are responsible as a steward to use the grace that's been given to us. That each and every one of us has received something from the Lord. We have received grace. With that grace came gifts. Now, individually, we can see in the Bible that we all have Gifts, and that's where Pastor Luke brought out our gifts for service, the unique things, our purpose, that sort of a thing. That that the way God designed us, that we have gifts, we have talents, and we have abilities. And that as we use those talents and abilities, that the grace of God can come upon them and fill in the gaps where we couldn't make something happen, God comes in and he makes it happen. But we are good stewards when we use the grace of God. Now we have to define what a steward is, and in order to do that, I want to bring out a story. Okay? There was a woman who got married. She was young in age, and she got married to a man, and this man had only known a harsh upbringing. And so when they got married, neither of them really knew what to do, but this man understood things that he had seen in his own household, and he understood what his mom used to do to take care of his dad. So when they got married, he wrote a list. And on this list, he wrote down all the things that he wanted his wife to do for him. I want you to get up at a certain time. I want you to make my breakfast. I want you to take care of the kids as we have children. Uh, They're going to be your responsibility. You're going to take them to school. You're responsible for their education. You're responsible for their upbringing. You're responsible for discipline. 
Uh, I want you to take care of the home. I want you to make sure that it's clean. I want to make sure that when I come home, everything is decent and in order. I want you to have all my shirts ironed for me so that when I go to work, everything is, is easy for me to get ready. Everything's pressed. Everything's neat. Everything's in order. I want you to color code it all. I want you to have it there available for me. He wrote this list, all right? These are the types of foods that I want to eat. These are the types of things that I, I, I like. And so you're going to go to the store and you're going to get these types of things. You're going to have our refrigerator stocked. You're going to have everything in order in the home. And he wrote this list out. And while they were married, she did the list. She made sure every day that she was checking the list to make sure that she was being a good wife. And so she continued year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month to do everything on this list. Now in the process of time, the man that she had married to died. And so she lived for a period of time as a widow. Now in the process of her life, she met another man. They fell in love and they got married. And this man started to just love her. He started to serve her. He started to take care of her. He, he, he would just lavish her with gifts. He'd bring flowers home at night. He knew what her favorite candies were, and every now and then he would just show up on his lunch break and surprise her with it. He, he was very thoughtful. He, he wrote cards to her, and, and, and would, if he would ever travel out of the area for work or business, that sort of a thing, he would send her a postcard with a picture of the place where he was, just kind of a fun little hello from that area. Even though he could call her, even though he could, he could talk to her, he still wanted to make sure she knew that everywhere he went, he was thinking about her. One day, the woman was going through her things, and she was kind of doing some spring cleaning in the house. And as she was doing that, she came across the list from her previous marriage. And she started to look over the list, and as she looked over the list, she realized that everything that was on that list, she was doing for this new husband, but it wasn't out of an obligation to a list. It was because she loved him that she got up early and made him breakfast. It was because she knew that he loved her, that she was now taking care of the home and cleaning his clothes and making sure he had everything he needed for work. It was out of a love for him that she made sure to go to the store and because she knew he knew her favorite candy, she found out his favorite meals and she started to put those things in her refrigerator. See, for all of us, we need to understand that the Bible is not just a list of do's and don'ts. This is the manual for life. This is the wisdom of God for each and every one of us. And we need to know this and we need to understand this. But the grace of God that is given to us is motivated by the love of God for us. God knows us intimately. He knows each and every part of us. He knows us uniquely. He's the one who formed us in our mother's womb. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And Jesus said, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. In other words, this is no longer out of an obligation. But rather, this is not off a list of things to do, but rather this is out of love that we find out about God and that we now live our lives accordingly and appropriately in response to and empowered by the grace of God. So what is a steward? A steward is somebody who is an overseer, somebody who is a manager. In, in the biblical context, they were an authorized agent to deal with the affairs of a house, of a city, or of a church. You can see that all throughout your Bible when you see somebody who is a steward. In fact, uh, it was used of people who were to have positions in the church as an overseer. They were called a steward of the church, right? Uh, as well, you can find it that there was a city treasurer, somebody who overlooked the finances of a certain city. He was called a steward. Uh, as well, Jesus in his parables talks about an owner of a house, and he talks about a steward. One of the stewards was bad. He beat up the other servants. He, he didn't take care of the house the way that he should. He got drunk, and the master came in an hour that he did not expect, and he cut him in pieces, right? That's pretty graphic what Jesus is talking about, really, but, but, but that was a steward of the house as well. He talks about the unjust steward, somebody who is authorized on behalf of his master to go and make business decisions for him. He had oversight of the money. He could speak on his behalf. Each and every one of us has been given the grace of God. And in response to the grace of God, remember, grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Now, remember, Tony Cook defined responsibility as our response to God's ability. Therefore, as stewards, we've been given the grace of God. We've been handed a gift. And our response to his ability is the responsibility of stewardship in each and every one of our lives. Now, not only does grace give us what we need, it empowers us to do what is required of us. Are you listening tonight? 
Romans chapter 5, verse number 17. Take a look at it with me. Let's take a look at it in the Word. Romans chapter 5. Verse number 17. It's been talking about how through Adam sin came into the world, but through Jesus Christ came salvation and righteousness. And in Romans chapter 5, verse number 17, it's in the middle of a thought, okay? So there's parentheses that are surrounding this. You'll see that in your Bible. You'll see that up on the overheads. If you didn't bring your Bibles tonight, you can just follow along on the overheads. Romans chapter 5, verse number 17, look at what it says. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Now I want to point something out. It's talking about everybody received from Adam the sin nature. When we were born, we were born into sin. But it talks about there's a difference between everybody and somebody, okay? And the difference between everybody and somebody is that there is somebody, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. In other words, remember we talked about this. Uh, Pastor Jim brought out a great word about salvation, that it is a gift, that is freely given to us. We cannot work our way up to do enough good works in order to save ourselves. Therefore, it is a gift and it is abundant. It, 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 it overflows the need, right? It exceeds the need. That, that is, if, if sin abounded, then grace abounded much more. We read that in the, in the next chapter of Romans. So here it says, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will do something. What will they do? When you have abundance of grace... And the gift of righteousness, right standing with God as well as right living for God, then what happens? You will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. In other words, God has not called you to live a life where you float down the lazy river and wherever the current takes you, that's where you go. You are called to manage the affairs of this life. You are called to be a steward and not just oversee and just take care of things and have the status quo. No, you are called to rule and to reign in life through Jesus Christ and the gift of grace that he's given you. Now, this may be news to you. Maybe you never knew that God wanted you to have authority. Maybe you never knew that God wanted you to rule and reign in life. But right there... In your Bible, you can see that God has called you not to just get kicked around by the world's systems. God has not called you to sit idly by as the devil beats the tar out of you and your family. Come on, somebody. God has not called you to sit by and watch world events and do nothing about it. God has called you as the church, the ecclesia, the gathered saints, the assembly, and the ruling, reigning authority that he has given his authority on the earth to. In other words, Jesus is the master, we are the steward, but we have authority to go forth in his name, in his dominion, in his power, in his grace, and to take care of business on the earth as he sees fit that we should. Now, God would not leave this sort of responsibility without leaving the wisdom to do it. Are you listening? Jesus, the Bible says, is our wisdom. He gives his strength, he gives his grace to carry out his will, his way. Okay, That's called the gift of righteousness that we talked about. Now, I want to show this to you in the Bible that Jesus is our wisdom, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, so you're in Romans, one book back, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 30 says this, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. In other words, Jesus Christ. You want to know what the wisdom of God is? Look at Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh, right? Jesus is the wisdom of God for us. He became wisdom. When Jesus lived life here on the earth, he showed us how to live the kind of life that God wants us to live. Jesus was the authorized agent. He showed us the Father. Now, Jesus was one with the Father, I and you and you and me, right? We know that Jesus spoke that to the Lord. But Jesus even submitted his will to the Father so much so that he said, I don't do the works that I do. They're not on my own, but only that which I see the Father doing. The words which I speak to you, he said, they are not my own. Even though he was the word, he said, they are not my own. I only say those things which I hear the Father say. So the Bible says Jesus Christ has become our wisdom, but he's also become something else for us. Look at the rest of the verse. It says, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness. In other words, 
You want to know what righteousness is? Look at Jesus. Look at how he lived. Look at what he did. See, he not only had the right standing with God, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased, but he also did the righteous works of God. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Right? But not only that, look at this. And sanctification. We talked about sanctification. Holiness, right? Being separated unto the Lord for a holy purpose. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, the book of Hebrews says, and yet he was separate from sinners. In other words, he stood out. He was different than anybody else. He was exclusively God's. His life was holy. But not only that, and redemption. In other words, he was the purchase price. He's the one who bought us out of the position of slavery to sin. And now brings us into righteousness and gives us his grace. So if you want to know what life should look like, you need to look at Jesus Christ. You need to look at the word. And when I say the word, I'm talking about the word, the entirety of the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. So if you want to know how practically it looks in life, you can look at the life of Jesus in the gospels. But if you want to see the entirety of what God wants to say, Jesus is the Logos. He is the entirety of the Word of God. This is the wisdom of God for our lives. Now, I have to make a statement here. When we receive Jesus, Jesus is the wisdom of God for us, right? So we have the wisdom, and we have the power of God, because Jesus was full of grace and truth. So Jesus brings us the truth, but Jesus also imparts to us the grace. He's the grace giver. Okay, so when you have Jesus, you have the wisdom of God, and you have the grace of God, right? Everybody tracking? All right, you got to stay with me. Grace does not replace wisdom. Grace empowers wisdom. Everybody understand? I got to make sure that we understand this, because to go where we're going tonight, you have to understand this. Grace does not replace wisdom. Wisdom. In other words, some people will say, I don't have to study the Bible. I don't have to do what the Bible says. It's not a list anymore. I've got grace. No, you're dumb. Grace does not replace wisdom. You can look at your neighbor and say, did he just call me dumb? Yes, I did. All right? If, If you're doing that, if you're saying that. Because grace does not replace wisdom. Grace empowers the wisdom of God. Right? Okay? Now... But wisdom, without the power to do it, doesn't work. Why? Because God asks you to do some pretty crazy things here in the Word of God. And God asks you greater things than you have ability to do in yourself. But God knows he's doing that. Because he knows that if you were able to do it in your own power, then you could get the credit for it. But if you have to rely on God's power, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it, that means that God gets the glory for it. Okay? Got to lay this stuff down. Okay? Now let me show you an illustration of this. Okay? The Macedonian church. You find them in the Bible. They're talked about a lot. Book of uh, 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, we'll take a look at a couple verses. The Apostle Paul is writing about them, and, and, and something happened. There was a famine that hit the land of Judea, okay? And all the churches started to gather up collections that they wanted to send to the saints in Jerusalem. There was a church that stood out. There was a church that in themselves was in deep poverty. It would be like if we heard, hey, you know what? New York City just got hit with a severe storm. And a bunch of churches over there, you know, they're they're all tore up. And we came and we said, well, you know what? We're we're a church here in San Bernardino. Uh, You know, the the city's been bankrupt. We've been in recession for a long. In fact, we never really climbed out of recession. There's just a new norm. People aren't making as much as they were making in 2008. We've kind of come down and and, and we've just stayed there. Things have have normalized and we're all used to it. But you know what? Really, we're in our own famine. We're, We're in deep poverty. People aren't making the money. Maybe we should go take a collection from Orange County. Or maybe we should go down to San Diego and take a collection. But you know what? We're different. We said, you know what? Really? Really, we want to have a part of this. We, we want to help out the church in New York. And so we started to gather together funds, and we started to, to kind of lead the, the charge and say, you know what, out of San Bernardino, we're going to do X amount of dollars, right? And so we, we raised that money, and we sent it off. That's what you see here in the Bible in the book of 2 Corinthians. The Macedonian church was impoverished, and yet they had a heart that said, we want to give. We want to be a blessing, now, with that in mind, take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 2 and verse number 3. I want to show this to you practically from the word of God. He's talking about the churches of Macedonia. Verse 2, he says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, I know we don't talk like that. You know, that's a lot of words all mixed in together, okay? And there was probably a lot, of, a lot of money spent just on those words right there, right? $20 words all mixed in there, okay? But let's break it down for a second. They're in a great trial of affliction, and yet they're joyful. They're going through trouble, and yet they've got smiles on their faces. And it says, and they're, you mix that together with deep poverty. When you add all that up in the natural, it equals we're not doing nothing. We're just happy being poor, Right? But when you add all that up in the spiritual, it says the, that, that their affliction plus their joy plus their deep poverty equaled abounding in the riches of their liberality. In other words, they were able to give freely and without restraint. Overflowing, overtaking, that's what abounding means. It's like a big dog running at you that finally overtakes you and jumps on you and licks your face, right? That's really what abounding is talking about. Is that them in this situation in their poverty were able to just be joyful then even though they were having a hard time that they were able to allow their gifts to just start to flow now look at the next verse it makes it even clear okay verse number three for i bear witness that according to their ability yes he stops he says wait a second i gotta stop right here yes i I gotta pause for a second according to their ability yes look at the next part of the verse and beyond their ability they were freely willing. Now, now hold on a second. It was their ability, yes, but also beyond their ability. In other words, they had a willing heart. They had something to give, but then even beyond that, something else took place. They were able to give even greater. Now, what happens when you go beyond your ability and you do something greater than you can do? It's grace, right? That means it had to be not, if it's not their ability, it had to be God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on their behalf when they couldn't do it. They had a heart that was bigger than their amount in their pocket to give, and yet because they had the heart and because God put in the grace, now all of a sudden it abounded in their liberality. Right? You guys getting this? It's in these contexts of verses that if you continue reading on, you go to the next chapter in chapter number 9, And verse number eight, and the Apostle Paul starts talking to the Corinthian church and says, I'm telling you this story about the Macedonians because I want to stir you guys up. You guys made a promise to give a gift and you haven't given it yet. But I want you guys to realize that this is not a natural thing, that this is a God thing, okay? Remember, we're talking about stewardship because oftentimes we make decisions based on the natural. Oftentimes we make decisions based on what we can calculate or what we have in hand and we don't make decisions based on the wisdom of Are you listening? Of God. So it's in this context, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, and verse number 8, that the apostle writes these words, very familiar words, we quote them all the time, but look at what he says. And God is able, everybody say God is able. able. That's grace, right? God is able to make all grace abound, like that big dog running at you. All grace abound where? Where? towards you. Picture a St. Bernard named Grace (laughs) with a big slobbery mouth and tongue hanging down running at you. That's what God is able to do. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always, not sometimes, not half the time, not most of the time, Not 99.9% of the time, but always. Some of you guys got this. Some of you guys are staring at me. You guys got to get a little little, little looser, all right? You guys got to need to learn from from some of the people that that, that know where we're going here. You you just got to keep saying, always, 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 Pastor. See, see, the less you respond, the longer I preach, okay? So the more you (laughs) respond, the shorter the message will get. That may not be true. I don't know. But that you always having all sufficiency. That means if you don't have it right now, the grace of God can make it up. That means if you don't know where it's coming from, that the grace of God will show you where it's coming from. That means that if you don't have time, the grace of God will make time. Are you listening? This is good news for all of us. Because there's stuff that you've wanted to do that you've been hindered from because you haven't tapped into grace. 
There's places you've wanted to go. There's ministry you've wanted to be a part of. There are things that you wanted to do. Some of you guys have a generous heart, but you have stopped right here. Your thinking has stopped you. Your calculations have hindered you. You have allowed the wisdom of this world rather than the wisdom of God to lead your decisions. There are businesses you have not started yet because you have been afraid that you can't do it because you know what, I gotta calculate up and and no one builds a wall without first making the calculations if he can build it or not. But listen, when you include in your equation the grace of God, he's the one that makes a way where there is no way. He's the one that provides streams in the desert. He's the one that raises up a path in the wilderness. He's the one who went to the cross and he was dead and yet he raised him again to life. He is the one who is supernatural. He is not bound by time or creation or space or matter or any of the other laws of this world. Gravity doesn't even work when God gets involved. You can find an iron axe head that floated up to the surface of the water in the Bible. Why? Because God said so. Because the grace of God was upon that situation. You can find where they had lack. We don't have enough to feed all these people that the grace of God came in. The power of God came in. Miraculous, dynamic power fed thousands of people. What is it that you've been wanting to do that you've been hindered from doing because you have not tapped into grace? Haven't even got through the verse. Always having all sufficiency in all things. Not just some things. All things, not just church things. All things, right? In witnessing, in parenting, in business, in relationships, in romance, in in, in all areas of your life. It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you're intending to do, if it's according to the wisdom of God, it is all things. God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants you to have a witness. God wants you to reach your family. God wants you to reach this nation. God wants you to do great and mighty things. God wants you to leave a legacy. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be holy. God wants you to serve others. There are so many things that God has for you, and yet we're living a small call find life because we haven't tapped into the grace of God. We've got to be better stewards of what God has given us, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance. You know what abundance is? That's more than enough. Abundance is overflow. Uh, abundance isn't a little dabble do you or just enough in the nick of time Oh, thank God. No. Abundance is, wow, I had more than I need. I I, got to find some people to give this away to. I've got so much. I'm so blessed. It's overflowing. Everybody around me just gets blessed. You know what? Tonight, I was going and getting myself uh, some dinner, and as I was coming out of the bathroom, washing my hands and coming out of the bathroom, I saw somebody that I knew, and I said, hey, don't let them pay. Let me See, when your life starts to expand, all of a sudden, people around you start getting blessed. It just becomes a part of you. Why? Because the grace that's been imparted to you. They have an abundance for every good work. The question is, is it a good work? Jesus said there's none good but God. That means that we have to be led by the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God. Is this what God wants for my life or not? If it is, then God will supply. If that's what God wants, God will direct you. So we have to tap into The grace of God. It's available to us. What is holding us back from the powerful life God wants for us? Is it our stewardship? Is it that we're not tapping into the grace? What is it? Is there a desire that we cannot fill in the natural that God wants to pour out grace? And he wants us to rule and reign in life. Are you being ruled by something else? Are you being ruled by time? Are you being ruled by sin? Are you being ruled by the systems of this world? Are you being ruled by money? What is it that's stopping you and hindering you? It's time for you as a steward, the one who has been delegated the authority of God on the earth, to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations in my name, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The one who said that those who believe in my name they shall cast out demons. In my name, they shall speak with other tongues. In my name, they will do miracles. In my name, they will trample on serpents and scorpions. You have the authority of God. You are a steward of the manifold grace of God, and to just hold on to it and do nothing with it is a waste. We've got to get better at this. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 said, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. We have to grow in this grace. That word grow really means to grow up, to, to become mature. That it means, it means like uh, you, you picture it. Jesus talked about seeds that have been planted, right? And, and they start to grow up. It means that we start to increase in our stature. It means that we start to stand tall. It means that we start to become strong. We're grounded in the things of God. That's really what that means. We are to grow in the grace. We are to become rooted deep in the grace. We are to grow up in the grace. We are to stand tall in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we grow in grace? How do we grow in grace? A couple of quick things as we wrap up this series tonight. Because each and every one of us need to grow in this area. We should be ruling and reigning in life, not letting the world dictate to us where we go on the pinball machine of life, getting knocked around by the devil, by the world's systems, and by whatever just happens. No, we are to rule and to reign in life. How do we grow in grace? Number one thing is this, faith. Faith. If you're gonna grow in grace, it's gonna take faith. Everything in life takes faith. You've heard us say this. There's, there's no other way to live life except by faith. You cannot do life without faith. You cannot please God without faith. Because everybody who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if we're going to grow in grace, if we're going to grow in our stewardship, grow in ruling and reigning in life, we have to do that by faith. God's grace is his power given. Our faith is God's power received. I've got that up there on the overheads for you. Okay, God's grace is his power given. Guys, can you do both of those at the same time? Maybe. I, I meant to have them both up at the same time. I apologize. God's grace is his power given. We understand that, that grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it, right? But if we're gonna grow in grace, then our faith is God's power received. In other words, you may not know where the grace is coming from. You may not feel electric tingles going through your fingers when you go to pray for somebody, okay? But you need the grace of God. So your faith says, I have it. Your faith says, I believe that I receive it. Your faith says, God, I'm asking for it, and therefore I have it, because it's according to your will. I know this is your will, God, therefore I know that as I step out, God, that you're going to hold my foot up. So grace is God's power given. Our faith is God's power received. Everybody's got that? Let's take a look at it in the Word together. Romans chapter 5, back to Romans chapter 5. This time, verse number two, right at the beginning, is talking about Jesus. We've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two, through whom, speaking of Jesus, also we have access, how? By faith, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Did you know your salvation is a doorway for every other area of life? Your salvation is show and tell for everything else you're gonna believe God for for the rest of your Christian walk. In other words, if you need grace for strength, if you need grace for sanctification, if you need grace for stewardship, how you got saved is show and tell for how you're going to get the grace for those other areas. How did you get grace for salvation? Well, I heard that Jesus went to the cross, that he died for my sins, and that he was raised again to life, and now that he offers salvation to everyone who believes. I said, I believe it. I prayed a prayer, and I invited and received the gift, and now I'm saved, right? That's show and tell. In other words, I need grace for sanctification. So I heard God wanted me to be exclusively his. I heard God wanted me not only to have the position, but to have the practice of what he calls righteous or right in his eyes, the wisdom of God. Therefore, God, I, I've heard what you say about my sanctification, that I gotta clean up my act, that I gotta put away some things, that I, I've gotta separate from things that are, would, would drag me back into old nature ways, and therefore, God, I pray that you give me the strength, that you give me the grace, and God, I receive it, and then you live your life accordingly. See, your salvation is show and tell for the rest of your life. We have access, by faith, into this grace, in which we now stand. You can only access it with the key of faith. It's the only way you're gonna to get to it. So how do we grow in grace? Number one is faith. Second thing is this, knowledge. Knowledge. If you wanna grow in grace, you gotta grow in your knowledge. The more you know, the more you grow. That's a fun little rhyme, isn't it? 
sounds like a PBS special or like one of those little more you know with the star going across and da na na, right? But it's true. The more you know, the more you grow. In other words, if, if I never knew that God wanted me blessed, I would never live blessed. If I never knew that God had a grace for me so that I could be healed, God had supernatural ability where I couldn't get healed, but I, I never knew that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who oppressed the devil. If I never knew that by his stripes I was healed, if I never knew any of that, then I would just live the way that life dictates to me. I would live sick. I would live broken. I would live tore up. And yet the more you know, the more you grow. The more you get into the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more knowledge of the word of God you get, now the more grace can be imparted to you. Okay? Let me show this to you once again in the word. Second Peter. Second Peter towards the end of your Bible. Second Peter. Chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. Peter writes, and he says this in verse number two, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, we would all say amen, right? I I don't have that much peace lately. You know, I look around, I watch the news, and it's just all troubling. I I take a look at what's going on in my family. I see the bills. I see, you know, the different things that are going on in the neighborhood, and and there's a lot of trouble. I would love to have peace multiplied to me. I need the grace, too. You know what? I need grace multiplied to me. I need the ability of God on my behalf when I can't do it. There's a lot of stuff that I can't do. A lot of stuff that I want to do, and I would love to have grace multiplied, not just added. Let's be done with addition, right? I want multiplication. So grace and peace be multiplied to you. How does that work? Look at this. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, if that wasn't enough, look at verse number three. As his divine Power, remember, grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when I can't do it, right? That's God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So as his divine power, his grace, has given to us how many things? Well, I think we saw that in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, didn't we? So as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, Through, once again, there's an avenue that this comes to us. Through what? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. See, one of the criticisms of church presently is it doesn't apply to my life. Can I tell you something? It all applies to your life. Every last bit of this book is readily applicable to your life, all of the wisdom of God, everything that we talk about, every story, every illustration, every text, even the genealogy. You know you can find Jesus in the genealogies? I mean, that is dry. You try and read that stuff, you will walk away and need a drink of water because your throat will be just sore. You won't even know why. But you know what? You can find Jesus in there. That's the whole point of it. Every part, all scripture is useful. All scripture is good. All scripture can teach us. It can lead us to Jesus. And as we grow in that knowledge, we will grow in that grace. And not just grow, it will be multiplied to us as we learn more. Now all of a sudden, God will start to open up exponentially his ability on our behalf when we can't do it. How do we grow in grace? Faith. How do we grow in grace? Knowledge. How do we grow in grace? Humility. I know we've said this before in this series, but we've got to say it again. You better be humble. James, chapter number four. You're there in 2 Peter. Turn back to James, chapter number four. The same verse is quoted by Peter in 1 Peter. But in James chapter number four, look at what he says in verse six. Speaking of God, it says, or the Spirit actually, it's talking about the Spirit who dwells in us. Verse six, but he gives more grace. In other words, we need to grow in grace. We need grace multiplied to us. And we need more grace, right? So that means that we're growing. We're we're standing up. We're coming to that stature. We're starting to raise up. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, in other words, because God is giving more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In other words, you want to grow in grace? You want more grace? You better be humble. You better lower yourself under the mighty hand of God 
that he will exalt you. In other words, there are heights that God wants to take you to that you can't go to on your own. But the way up is down. In other words, you humble yourself under God's mighty hand. And humility really is just depending on God. In other words, God, I don't know how to do life. God, I, I, I don't see how the Bible is applicable to my life. Many of you probably have read that and said, I don't understand it. I don't know it. I don't know how to apply it. Pastor said all of this applies, but I don't get it. Here's how you get it. You say, God, I need you. Spirit of grace, I need you to reveal this to me. I need you to open the eyes of my understanding. I need you to enlighten me. There is dark places in here, and I just don't get it. So God, you've got to reveal this to me. God, you've got to speak to me. God, you need to come and talk to me about this. God, open up the scriptures to me. God, I, I can't do this in life. I can't do business, Lord. I, I, I need your help, God. I can't make things happen. I can go out there and be diligent. I can do all that stuff, but I need your grace to come in. And you humble yourself, and you depend on God for every area of your life. The moment you say, God, I don't need you anymore, God resists the proud. The moment you say, God, I got this, no, you don't. Because the moment you back off God, the Bible doesn't say he backs off you, it says he resists you. That resist is like actively warring against you. That's scary. Because God's bigger. Right? You want to go in an arm wrestling match with God, you will lose every time. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to grow in grace, humble yourself. God will give you more grace. Last thing, how do we grow in grace? Faith, knowledge, humility. Last one, and I like this one, bold prayer. Not just prayer. Bold prayer. I had to say that because that's what the word says. Hebrews, turn there with me, chapter number four. Very familiar verse, but let's take a look at it with the eyes of stewardship tonight. Hebrews chapter four, verse number 16. Let us therefore come. Oh, come on, you can't say it like boldly. Let's try that again, okay? You gotta get some gumption. You know what that is? You gotta get the gusto. You, got, you gotta get a little San Bernardino tonight. I know some of you guys are from Redlands. Some of you guys are upper crust Riverside, okay? Some of you guys are up on the hill of Grand Terrace. But tonight, you're in San Bernardino, all right? I'm a kid that grew up in Moval, all right? So tonight, we're all together here at a church in San Bernardino, okay? So all of us together, we are gonna get a little ghetto, all right? We're gonna get a little San Bernardino, San Bernadizzle, right? And for Rizzle. So Tonight, you can't say boldly like boldly. Okay? No, tonight, get a little edge. Get, get, get a little lean in that, in that, in that step tonight. Get, you, get, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get a little San Bernardino on it, all right? Okay, so here we go. Therefore, let us come how? Boldly. That's what I'm talking about. Boldly. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. See, you cannot get around God because Jesus was full of grace and truth. Therefore, his throne, because he's sitting on it, is a throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy. Now remember, in the natural, we're not worthy. But in the spiritual, because we've been born again, now we've been given permission to enter in. And God extends the scepter of his righteousness to us and says, you may enter. We obtain mercy, but what else happens there at the throne of grace? And find grace to help in a time of need. Anybody have a need in this place tonight? Anybody need something from God? Anybody need more grace? Anybody just, just say, I can't do this on my own. I need the wisdom of God. I need to be a better steward. Uh, there's things I need to see happen in my life. See, you aren't going to get it on your own. you got to humble yourself, and then you got to boldly come. Now, now, humility and boldness seem like two different things, right? We almost seem like, well, I can't be humble and bold at the same time. Yes, you can when you realize humility is not thinking less of yourself but rather depending on God, right? So I'm going to boldly depend on God. Amen? That means when I come to my prayer closet, when I hit my knees, when I'm in the car driving to, to church or to work or wherever I'm going, driving home at night, 
I'm praying, but I'm saying, God, I need you. God, if ever I needed you, that moment right now is now, God. I need the grace of God. God, I, I need you to show up. God, I need you to give me the wisdom. God, I need you to give me the provision. God, I need your power. God, I'm going to go pray for somebody, and I need you to show up and touch them, Lord. God, I'm going to speak to somebody about Jesus. I need you to show up and speak to them, Lord. God, I'm going to go, and I'm going to do what it is you called me to do. But God, if I step out and you're not there, I'm falling flat. So God, I need you to show up. I need you to secure my steps. God, I need you to make a way. God, I need you to pave the road. God, I need you to come through. God, I need you. That's humble boldness for each and every one of us. Guys, tonight, we're growing. We're all in this together. Pastor Dan is growing right there with you. Listen, I have not arrived. I, I, I'm not the, the, the one that's showing you this. Jesus is the one who showed us all this. Jesus depended on God, and Jesus was bold. Jesus operated, the Bible says he tasted death by the grace of God for all of us. Jesus operated in the grace, the power of God, the ability of God. He showed us how to live an extraordinary grace-filled life. He showed us how to represent God on the earth and how to be a steward and how to rule and to reign in life. That's the kind of life God wants all of us to live because the Bible says as he is, so are we in this world. And now we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. That means that we should be looking to Jesus to find out the works that he wants us to do. Listening to his words, and those are the words that we speak. And watching his heart and emulating that heart to a lost and dying world. Tonight, the grace of God is available to all of us. And God wants us to use that grace for stewardship. He wants us to live a life where we're not knocked around from pillar to post but know that we would rule and reign in life through Jesus Christ and by his grace. You guys get something from this series? Come on, let's give God a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated at this time because I want to talk to you about your life. We had said that, you know, this grace that we've been given is a free gift. You can't work your way up to get yourself saved. You know, each and every one of us in this place, everybody born on the planet, the statistic is still the same. Everybody's going to die sometime. And even if Jesus comes back before that happens, the Bible says we may not all die, but we will all be changed. We're all going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to come a time where a decision's going to be made about our lives. We all get to go before Jesus, but we don't, all don't get to stay. And we're either going to be declared right before God, and we're going to be able to hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Or we're going to hear these words, away from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. Now those would be the most terrible words for all eternity that you could ever hear. And tonight, I don't want that for you. I love you too much to let you just sit idly by and say, hey, we had a great time in church. We laughed, we sang, and let you go tonight. You die. You go before that judgment seat, and you end up hearing those words. You go from the presence of God, and the Bible says that those who are sent out of the presence of God are tormented in hell forever. Now, many people would say, well, I don't believe a loving God would do that. And yet, the Bible says that a loving God gives us the free will choice while we're here on the earth, loves us so much to give us the choice whether we will love him in return. You get the revelation of the love of God that the love of God was expressed in Jesus. He took the punishment for our sin. He took the penalty as he was crucified on the cross. The wrath of God for our sin was poured out on Jesus. In other words, it doesn't have to be poured out on you if it's poured out on Jesus. And by faith, we enter into that grace, the ability of God on our behalf when we can't do it. You cannot save yourself. In other words, you can't say, well, you know what, I'm going to clean up my act. I've been really a, a rascal, but I'm going to clean up my act, and, and, and God will see that and let me into heaven. It doesn't work like that. You can't attend enough church. You can't be raised in enough church. Parents telling you you're Christian, born in America. Can't do enough good deeds or get involved in social justice causes. You cannot do enough good works. You can't sing enough in a choir, carry a pastor's Bible, make decisions in a church, teach in a Bible class, get a membership card to a church, memorize enough scripture, Sing enough songs. You can't do enough good deeds to work your way into heaven. It has to be God's ability. 
and not your ability. You're not going to get to heaven because of your church attendance. You're not going to get to heaven because you got involved in good works. You're not going to get to heaven because you volunteered at a church. You're not going to get to heaven because of what you know about God. This is all about your heart. Jesus said it like this to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Guy was probably better than all of us in this room, and yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, you're cool, man, don't worry about it. Just keep doing what you're doing, I'll see you in heaven. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know, I know, you've seen born-again people on movies, television, Hollywood, books, and the internet. You said, they're weird. I don't want to have any part of that. Listen, if you don't have any part of that, you will have no part of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus said, you must. There's no other way. You must be born again. Well, I believe all roads lead to heaven. Well, that's foolish, because that's not what the Bible says. Remember, this is the wisdom of God. This is the God-breathed, inspired word that God tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the Bible. Not all roads lead to heaven. You think God goes to the cross? Jesus is beaten, bloody, crucified, takes on the weight of sin and the punishment, the wrath of God for all of us, and then says, yeah, whatever you want to do, it's cool. No, he tells us exactly how in his word. He says, you must be born again. One way to get to heaven. You must be born again. What does that mean? Well, it's not what society says. It's not that weirdo stuff that you've seen. It's what the Bible says. Being born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. And what is lukewarm? That's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So that means lukewarm Christianity is not real Christianity at all. Come on, tonight... Let's stop playing games with God. Let's get right with God. Let's do this his way, giving God all of your heart, all of your life. At that moment that you do that, that's where the grace of God comes in, takes hold of your life, takes you out of that position of headed for hell, and now you're headed for heaven, doing this God's way. I'm gonna ask everybody in this place tonight just to take a moment of introspection. I wanna give you a private moment with God, and I want you to just think about some things for a moment. So everybody bow your heads, close your eyes at this time. Just take a private moment, okay? Tune everything else out. I want you to just think for a second. Tonight, this was your last night on the earth. Maybe you died or Jesus came back. You went before that judgment seat. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Now, if you said, well, mm, I think, I hope, maybe, I don't know. Or if you said, I I know I'd be headed for hell. Tonight, listen up. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, That's your opportunity to respond. Here's how it's going to look. You're just going to simply raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it, and you can put it right back down. Now listen, this is a private moment. No one's looking around. Everybody's got their heads bowed and eyes closed. This is just you and God right now. And then after that, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? So we'll count the hands. We'll gather you up together up here up front, and we'll pray together, all right? It couldn't get any easier tonight. Because remember, this is not your ability. This is God's ability, a simple prayer. If you want to be included in that prayer tonight, get ready to get your hands up. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of two. God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this before, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, let's get serious about God tonight. Get ready to get your hand up. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now if that's you. You need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. Raise it up high for me right now if that's you. There's one. Thank you. Who else on this side? That's you. Just raise it up high and give me a little wave if I don't see you right now. Just raise it up high. Anybody else real quick? There's two. Got you. Thank you. There's three over here. I see you. If you asked yourself that question, where would I go? 
If I was before the judgment seat, would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? Just ask that question in your heart. No, I don't know the answer, but you and God. If you don't know, or if you know I'm headed for hell, come on tonight. Let's go for God. There's three wise people already. Is there anybody else in this place? I'm going to wrap this thing up. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? Just get your hand up high for me, and then we're going to pray together. If you want to be included in that prayer, just get it up high for me right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's all stand. At this time, come on. Come on, let's all stand. And if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Let's welcome them as they come. Just come on. I want to pray with you right now. Come on down. Come on down. Let's pray together. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. Let's pray together. This is your time. This is your moment. Everybody else, if you need to come, this is your time. Come on. Come on down right now. Everybody else, if you need to come, come on. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. They're coming. They're still coming. Come on. Even if you didn't raise your hand, this is your time to come. Come on, come on, come on. Praise God. I'm so happy that you guys came. We're going to pray that prayer together. Look up here at me for a second. All right, this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. You can put a smile on your face. Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I know sometimes it's tough. You're walking away from something that's tough, okay? But really, this is the best decision of your entire life right here, right now, okay? I'm going to lead you in that prayer, all right? And those of you that are joining us online, if you raise your hand, hey, get ready to pray this prayer with us. I'm going to pray a simple prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Now, listen. I know it may be kind of tough to hear with the speakers over your heads and all that kind of stuff, but if you mess up on a word or two, don't worry about it. It's not a formula, okay? This is your heart going before the Lord. God doesn't listen to just the words of your mouth. He looks at the prayers of your heart right now. So you're going to be born again, all right? Let's all bow our heads once again. Let's close our eyes. and want everybody to join in together, especially those of you who are up front and those of you that need to pray this prayer for the first time, wherever you're at. Say these words together with me. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Cleanse me of my past. And give me a new future with you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. God is good. Now listen, those of you that prayed that prayer, all right, we want to give you some free information. We want to encourage you in your new walk with God. Help you to get some more knowledge like we talked about so you can grow in the grace of God that you just received for your salvation. So right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. He wants to give you that free information. Wants to talk to you about a program we have. Really, it's a person. Okay, more than a program, someone who will come alongside you, who loves you enough to encourage you in your new walk with God. He'll tell you about that. It'll take you a couple of minutes, and then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you, okay? So if you guys just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.